Hi, my name is Andy Milburn. I'm 70 years old and I'm an architect. I live and work in Dubai at a practice called Godwin Austin Johnson. Our office uses Enscape with both Revit and SketchUp on a regular basis. But in this session, I won't be talking about my day job. The focus here is on my passion for old buildings and how the way we build provides clues to the nature of human culture in all its diversity across space and time. Fifty years ago, I was an architecture student in London, embarking on life's great adventure. Forty-five years ago, I was a bricklayer in the industrial north of England, identifying with the working class and playing in a band. Thirty-five years ago, I was a building teacher in newly independent Zimbabwe, writing textbooks, training teachers, visiting rural schools. And 30 years ago, I was a student in South Africa, finishing my architectural degree. 20 years ago, I was travelling to Malawi every month as I watched the Zimbabwe economy collapse around me. And 15 years ago, I was in Dubai, using Revit, grateful to be earning real money, to pay for university fees for my children. So, I grew up in the north of England with a pencil in my hand, very much a visual thinker. I decided to become an architect, but I changed my mind during the first degree. I went back up north trying to rediscover my working class roots, spent my twenties working on building sites, retrained as a bricklayer, and played in a band. At the age of 30, I volunteered to teach building at an experimental school in newly independent Zimbabwe. I ended up staying in Zimbabwe for 23 years. I wrote building textbooks, trained teachers, administered exams. Then as I was approaching 40, I decided to give architecture another shot. I finished my training as an architect and I completed a wide range of projects in Zimbabwe and Malawi over the next 12 years. But from 2000 onwards, Zimbabwe imploded politically and economically. So luckily I was able to come to Dubai in 2004 and I've worked at Godwin Austin Johnson ever since mostly as a Revit specialist and BIM champion. For more than 10 years, I've been running a blog and attending international conferences. For a while, I was known for my submissions to the Parametric Pumpkin competition, using Revit in a playful and somewhat unconventional way, bordering on the realms of art. Then, in 2015, I stumbled across something called Project Zone. Project Zone started life as a competition, but also a collaboration. For a while I'd been exploring the classical style of architecture and using Revit to unlock the secrets of this ancient approach to creating beautiful buildings and cities. The Bank of England has a fascinating history, emerging during the age of Newton and helping to lay the foundations for the Industrial Revolution. So this competition was just the challenge that I was waiting for, and I became immersed in it for the next three years, well beyond the actual competition phase. I devoted most of my weekends to building up the model. This architectural gem was the product of three successive architects over the course of a century of relentless expansion. Sir John Soane was the third of these and worked on the bank for 45 years, doubling its size and weaving it together into a unified whole. Sadly, Soane's masterpiece was demolished after the First World War to make way for another doubling of size. 
Many drawings and models survive, however, in the Soane Museum in London, and we had access to those. There's nothing remotely like an as-built set, but for me this created a wonderful challenge, a historical jigsaw puzzle in four dimensions, with many lessons about the interaction between built form and the societies that inhabited those forms, a living, breathing history. Revit is great for maintaining a coordinated set of annotated plans, elevations and sections while the model is evolving. It's not so good at taking you inside the building and providing a first-person experience. That's where Enscape comes in and it has become an essential part of my work do doing historical research with BIM. For me, visualisation is not an end in itself. I'm not a rendering specialist. Rendered views come in several flavours. Still images, panoramas, videos, VR experiences. With Enscape, these can be integrated into my workflow, which is essentially an exploratory problem-solving process. In my day job, I do design development work for commercial projects. In my side gig, I explore history, deep dives into the way that buildings work. When I first started using Enscape on Project Stone, Stone, I took a walk around the whole building, capturing screenshots along the way. This approach created an amazing resource for assessing the current status of the model. I went on to combine views into annotated collages that helped to guide my work moving forward. This is quite different from preparing finished renders to wow a client. It's a workflow using Revit, Enscape, Photoshop, etc. to inform decision making. It's integrated into an active, hands-on research process. Grey clouds often have silver linings. Notre Dame came into my life by a way of a tragic fire. But the timing was right for me to move on from classical architecture and 18th century England. Project Notre Dame began as a voluntary collaboration between interested BIM addicts across the globe, and it kept up its momentum for about a year. Since then, it has lain dormant for the most part, but the model is still there on BIM 360 and may well see another burst of activity at some point. It was a terrific experience as a team venture. There's something special, I think, about a line drawing. The clarity, the ability to dimension and annotate. Orthographic projection itself is a wonderful invention, to a large extent a product of the Enlightenment. I really love the complementary insights that come from using orthographic line drawings in com combination with rendered perspectives and VR experiences. Section views allow you to stand back and see the big picture, to visualise the forces transmitted through the flying buttresses, to see the roof void above the masonry vaults with the ancient roof trusses that caught fire so tragically. My first time to use a VR headset with Enscape was inside our Notre Dame model flying through the nave and floating up into the bell towers was a mind-blowing experience. The textures and lighting that you experience with Enscape really help to convey the majesty 
of Gothic architecture. We talk about real-time rendering and photoreal quality, but what is reality? Surely it is multifaceted. This brings us back to BIM, which is inherently about integrating multiple channels of data into a unified, interconnected whole. From the beginning, Revit always had rendering capability, but rendered views were never live in the way that plans, sections, elevations, and even schedules are. Enscape changes this, bringing the richness of photoreal textures and lighting into the live interactive workflow that BIM models enable. We can now flip back and forth between line drawings, color-coded diagrams and immersive VR, all generated from the same central database and evolving in real time. There are many reasons for processing a rendered image. In line with the rapid real-time philosophy of Enscape 3D, my approach to post-processing is basically quick and dirty. Working with BIM, you have a model that evolves over time, and it's quite possible that you'll be updating an image three or four times as the work proceeds. So as a rule of thumb, I like to limit myself to five or ten minutes of processing time in an application like Photoshop. Once you've developed a range of techniques that you like to use in various combinations, you can roll these out pretty rapidly while making choices on the fly. In this case, it went like this. Right click on the background layer, duplicate, desaturate, reduce the opacity. New layer, fill with white, Add layer mask, use a large soft brush to reduce opacity in the centre. In other words, you're fading out the edges of the image with a white overlay. Then I cheated a bit, faking the existence of a lintel over the window head on a new layer. And finally, I duplicated the background layer again applied an artistic filter, dropped the opacity a bit, moved it up above the grey layer and added another mask to reduce the effect in the centre. This was improvised but it made the roof timbers glow at the edges which I quite like. Overall the effect is more artistic than the original with a focus on the winter head at the centre which is what the dramatic perspective that I originally chose is also doing. So I'm building on the strengths of the subconscious decisions that I make when I'm exporting a series of images from Revit, looking for images that grab the attention while conveying a message. For many people using Enscape, the message is all about selling a design to a client or perhaps to the partners in your firm. In the examples I'm showing here, the story is about the different craft techniques and architectural styles that have been used at different times and places around the world. It's an explor exploration of the way we build. So one branch of my work involves technology studies. There are so many ways of constructing windows and doors or detailing the eaves of a roof. And these vary in different parts of the world and diff different historical eras in characteristic ways. In Zimbabwe, standard steel frames made a lot of sense bearing in mind the climate, 
standards of maintenance, artisan skills, etc. In the hundred-year-old terrace houses that I renovated when I was in my twenties in the north of England, carved stone lintels spanned vertically oriented openings housing timber sliding sash windows with cast iron counterbalance weights housed in hollow boxes concealed within brick rebates. The combination of tinted line work sections generated from Revit geometry with live renders from Enscape has been groundbreaking for me. Many of these studies were begun some years ago, well before the Enscape era. Coming back to those Revit files and beef beefing them up with Enscape in my back pocket has been very revealing. This is typical of a BIM workflow. You put in the hours up front to construct a basic model and this work pays off further down the line as you enter an iterative process. Back in the 1980s, when I was working as an educator in Zimbabwe, we, we produced a book that took a simple rural house and described the process of building it step by step with hand-drawn illustrations. I've been working on a digital version of this for a while now, slowly. Enscape can really help to bring these models to life. Whether as fully rendered image, images or by way of blended views that combine the clarity of line drawings with the textural quality of rendered images. Most people use rendering to present final di designs, but I really think it has tremendous potential on, in the context of this kind of instructional work. I've always seen drawing as a mode of visual thinking. This applies equally to hand sketching, physical models and intel intelligent digital formats. I'm a big fan of using all these modes in parallel to gain insights into whatever topic I'm studying. It's all part of drawing to understand. The modern movement of the early 20th century made a big show of stripping ornamental detail from its architectural language. As a result, the commercial work that I do in my day job can generally be handled quite comfortably using native Revit geometry. Classical details are more challenging. It's a challenge that has fascinated me for many years. How do you hit that sweet spot? Just enough detail, but not too much. Capturing the essence without going too far down the rabbit hole. Actually, this has always been a central challenge of drafting. There is always an element of simplification, abstraction, stylized representation when drawing buildings. The ability to slide the time of day back and forth in real time is one of my favorite features in Enscape. With traditional rendering, it's not easy to catch those low sun angles at the right moment. Lots of tedious trial renders to get the orange glow at the right intensity and the drama of the long shadows hitting the right spot. Real-time rendering is a true game changer for those dawn and dusk atmospherics. Ducks, dusk is also a great time of day to show the glow of internal lighting while still retaining enough definition on the exterior elevation. 
I started modelling Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House several years ago after attending a Revit conference in Chicago. It's a real classic of the prairie style which has influenced so many generations of architects for more than a century now. This seemed to me like an ideal opportunity to test out the use of Revit lighting fixtures when rendering using Enscape. Firstly, his light fittings are an integral part of the, his design aesthetic. Secondly, the dramatic rhythms of his glazing treatment presented a great opportunity to test that dusk turning point effect. By trial and error, I discovered that the best approach for capturing the illumination of the space, as well as the geometry of the opal globes within square wooden frames, was to combine a light source with an emissive material. This makes sense when you think about it. The actual fittings transmit light, as well as capturing some of that energy to make the sphere itself glow. The interior views illustrate this better. The human eye and brain process, image, process images in a very sophisticated way. Photographs often burn out the detail around exposed light fittings. But moving around a room our brains piece together rapid eye movements together with our expectations to balance out the contrasts. I like to trust those same subconscious image processing routines in my brain to guide me when laying, layering an image in Photoshop to focus attention, balance the tones, conjure up an atmosphere. In this case, I set up a subtle gradient of saturation from left to right, tweaked the brightness on one side and layered up a couple of artistic effects using masking and transparency to create the final image. St Anne's Limehouse is a church that I've known for almost 50 years. A couple of years ago, I made a contact through LinkedIn called Rufus Frampton, who is involved in the local restoration committee, who are putting up a noble effort with, quite frankly, inadequate funding to maintain this important example of English Baroque, which is more than 300 years old. Rufus was kind enough to take me up the bell tower and show me around last time I was in London. And this inspired me to model the church during the COVID lockdown period. Some months later, I realised that this was another opportunity to explore the atm atmospherics of electric lighting with the added drama of a stained glass window in the East End. I'm trying to portray the drama of a Baroque church in the East End of London as it might have looked in the Victorian era when electric lights were first installed. The chandelier fittings are based on old photographs but the wall lights are my own invention added for purely dramatic effect. The second shot, looking back towards the organ and the bell tower, has not been processed. It's just a render exported directly from Enscape. By the time I'd tweaked the sun angle and the intensity of the lights, fine-tuned the viewpoint, it just seemed to me that the image had sufficient presence and balance as it was. I even decided against adding more people. Originally I had just placed a few Enscape assets while I was working on the lighting effects 
in intending to fill out the congregation later on. But looking at the image, there's something about the haunting emptiness that suits the sombre mood. The blue glow of dusk, the spiderweb shadows. So, I've been sharing a bit of my life story and my passion for understanding buildings. Why they are the way they are, what factors shape them, what values they express, and so on. I've tried to show how I've developed a hands-on research method for studying the way we build and how real-time rendering can be integrated into that process as one channel among many, all held together by the power of BIM, a data-rich model acting as a single source of truth. I've tried to share one or two tips along the way and perhaps you've learned something that will help you develop your technical skills. But, and it's a big but, my main message is to look at Enscape in a holistic way. To see how you can integrate it into your design and problem solving processes. To remain fluid, keeping an open mind about the techniques that will suit your current situation. Learn to trust your instincts and be prepared to improvise. There's a lot of power in our subconscious brain if we can learn to harness it and unleash that power. I hope you found some of my work inspiring and relevant to your own use cases for Enscape and the way this integrates with the parent applications and other tools that you use. The global collaborations of Project Zone and Project Notre Dame were wonderful experiences for me. So if there's anyone out there who would like to join in this kind of team venture, I'm always open to another initiative along these lines. One thing that's been on my mind for quite a while now is the idea of creating Enscape assets suitable for historical settings. So if you have some interest and expertise in the area of custom asset creation, maybe you could produce some guys in frock coats and three-cornered hats or a coach in horses um, or maybe even a hunchback of Notre Dame. Thank you for listening. I really enjoyed putting this together. Kudos to the Enscape team for setting it up and being such innovators in the BIM world. Thanks again.